Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for coming to the Friday seminar today. Um, unlike um, Daniel, who's supposed to be usually doing the intros, I'm doing the introduction today myself because we've got a very special guest, Professor George Franks from the University of Illinois. Um, George got his, um, came here from the US where he studied at MIT and then at the University of um, Santa, Barbara. Santa Barbara in California before coming to Australia to join um, Graham Jamison at the University of Newcastle before finally moving over to the University of Melbourne. And uh, George specializes in many areas of research, primarily surface chemistry is pertaining to ceramics, but also polymer design. And George is the primary reason why I am standing here today because many years ago, he brought me over from Canada to do a postdoc with him. So after today's session, you are free to go ahead and vent your anger if you're comparing that <laughs> because now you know who to blame. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand over to George. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to the, the um, Friday seminar series. It's a pleasure to be here. I had a, a nice day at um, St. Lucia yesterday to talk, talk with a number of, of, of people there, as well as um, spending the day here. And what I'm going to talk about today is work uh, we've been doing through our ARC Center of Excellence for Enabling Eco-Efficient Beneficiation of Minerals in um, How to Improve Fines Flotation Recovery by Flocculation Flotation. And it's primarily um, work done by my students, PhD students, Jacqueline and Regina, uh, my former student, Will, my postdoc, Casey. Uh, Lisa has had a, a, a role as a co-supervisor and a long-term collaborator. And um, in fact, I'm gonna start from the beginning. When I first came to Australia about the, I went to Newcastle about 20, 22, three years ago. Graham said small hydrophobic flocks. We need small hydrophobic flocks. And initially, we um, started working with temperature responsive polymers for solid liquid separation. So in just flocculation area. After a while, we realized that those bespoke polymers are a bit expensive and the need to change temperature is probably not going to make it economically attractive in solid liquid separation, but that we could add significant value by recovering more fine minerals, which might make it um, worthwhile. And we worked on that for a while. And more recently, in the last five years, we've been working on um, avoiding the temperature change and the bespoke polymers and try and do the same thing we can by aggregating and making those aggregates hydrophobic with commodity reagents. And we, the first step in that is making sure we can selectively aggregate the mineral that we, we want. And then the second step is adding a surfactant or collector to make them hydrophobic. And so just a little bit of a tutorial. So the polymers at the surface of particles control whether the particles are attractive or repulsive, and they can control the surface hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity. And so we use the te um, temperature responsive polymers to be able to switch back and forth between a hydrophilic surface and a hydrophobic surface and switch back and forth between acting as a dispersant, keeping the particles separated or acting as a, a flocculant and bringing the particles together. The polymer that we've, we're using is poly uh, NIPAM, which is a temperature responsive polymer, which at room temperature is, is um, well hydrated by water molecules, hydrogen bond to the carbonyl and the, um, the amine group. Uh, upon heating above 32 degrees C, there's enough thermal energy to break those hydrogen bonds. The water pisses off, and then the carbonyl groups uh, will bond to the amine groups on a different polymer chain, uh, removing the hydrophilic bits from the water, exposing the, the polymer um, backbone to the water and um, making the polymer hydrophobic and poorly soluble in water. And this is a reversible transition. And so we can use it at, um, so in these sedimentation columns, here's a, a example at 22 degrees where you can see nothing's happening. Just get it pointed. Yeah. 
Oh, uh, this doesn't work as a point. Okay, it doesn't matter. Anyway, you can see it's 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 um it's it's aggregated at 50 degrees and settles rapidly. We um about 10 years ago, we or more mainly Lisa, I think, built this this mini thickener where we could um, run as a continuous um, feed from the top, let the sediment form, and then we um, the over or the clarified water overflows. We pumped the underflow out of the bottom, and we took samples and measured the solids content and the rheolog rheological behavior of the underflow with conventional polymers, flocculants, and with the temperature response of flocculant. And what we found is that the conventional flocculants produced a lower solids concentration, and uh, we could increase the solids concentration with the temperature responsive polymer under the proper conditions. And when we added a little bit of conventional flocculant, we could reduce the, the um, overflow concentration to a, a low level as well. Without the, without the second polymer, actually, we, we got a high solids concentration just with the temperature response of polymer, but the, the overflow wasn't as clear as we wanted. So we could make some significant improvement in the um, uh, density of the underflow. And furthermore, we looked at the rheological behavior of the underflow. And when we use conventional flocculants <clears throat> or the temperature response of flocculant at 50 degrees C, we have a high viscosity, a shear thinning viscosity, which is like a paste, right? A very paste, you're, you're sure you're familiar with paste kind of underflow. When we discharge the polynipam uh, underflow at 20 degrees C, we get a very low and nearly Newtonian um, rheological behavior. And we calculated that um, the pumping cost to pump the underflow, to, you know, I forget what, five or 10 kilometers to a tailings pond, and it was it reduced the the pumping energy by about a third. And I thought, this is great. That that's you know millions of dollars a year for for a single thickener. And then it was only, you know, and this is the message for young people: really do a good techno-economic analysis early on instead of 10 years later. <laughs> <laughs> because you might get some nice scientific publications, and then you find out what, what it means is that the polymer can only be. 33% more expensive than the conventional polymers. And the conventional polyacrylamide flock points are like about $5 a kilogram. And so to make uh, a copolymer or a temperature responsive polymer, and when we talked to all the polymer companies, it just wasn't really viable for the solid liquid separation application. So what we, yeah, so that's basically what this is. Um, so, what we, we decided we could do, what we, we realized is my um, research fellow, the one I had before Lisa was named Hai Hong Lee, came from Alberta. And when we were doing the um, sedimentation tests, you take a, a, right, a cylinder, you shake it around a bit and you, you let, let the particles settle. And I always noticed, oh, there's a bit of foam on the top and a few particles there. And I, I said, okay, I'm not gonna worry about that because 99.9% .9 of the particles are settling. And Hai Hong looked at that and he says, oh, I think these particles are sticking to the air bubbles. We can use this as a flotation reagent. So what we do is we um, um, use the polymer to both aggregate the particles and make those particles hydrophobic. So the aim is, um, I'm sure as you all know that um, Fine particles, uh, flotation recovery is very low, below about you know, 20 or 40 microns. Um, and, and depending on the, you know, you can lose between 10 to 20% or even um, in, in um, lithium, they're losing a lot more than this um, of the fine particles um, to tailings. And so our aim is to, to get a polymer, which, and, and in this case, we work with the temperature response of polymers, where we copolymerized them with something which made the polymer absorb selectively onto the valuable mineral, increase the temperature, um, the polymer becomes hydrophobic, collapses onto the particle, there's hydrophobic attraction between the particles, they become an aggregate, and then those hydrophobic aggregates can be removed by, by froth flotation. And so just some uh, contact angle measurements, 
which show a droplet of water on a on a on a quartz surface with um, that's been treated with the polymer at room temperature. We have wetting, and at high temperature, we have um, increasing contact angle, and that increasing contact angle increases with polymer molecular weight, which is fine because, of course, we want a high molecular weight polymer to act as a flocculant anyway. And we had a student named um, Will Ng about, probably he's been finished for about probably four years, so maybe he started eight years ago. And when Lisa was at CSIRO, he worked with, with Lisa and I at CSIRO. And he did two main projects. Um, one was separate, uh, separating hematite from quartz. We can also, I have a student now, I won't have time to talk about it today, but, mm -hmm. but separating spudgamine from quartz. And then we're also gonna try to do something about feldspar, but it, it doesn't look like it's easy to separate from spudgamine at the moment. Um, and so what we do is we take our um, a functionality, chemical functionality from the conventional um, collectors like sodium oleate to, to collect hematite. And we're gonna graph that functionality onto the temperature responsive polymer. In the case of um, chalcopyrite, um, separating from quartz, Will took a xanthate functionality and grafted that onto the polynipam. Okay, in the first case, here's the, the polymer with about 16, 15% uh, acrylic acid with the polynipam. Um, we got an ore from Valet, about 56% hematite. The average particle size was about uh, 40 to 50 microns. And I'm not going to show the, um, the chemistry that the iron analysis is in the, the papers, but you can see with the anionic polynipam, the floats were dark red, the tails were looked like sand. Um, when we used sodium oleate for this finer size, we had a, a less efficient separation such that the, um, the tailings contained more hematite and the, the grade of the um, flotation product was not as good. The second polymer that Will used was a, um, a xanthate functional polynipam. And here we had uh, North Park's um, copper ore with about 0.67 copper. And here's the um, flotation in a flotation column. He did work in a mechanical cell and he went up to work with Graham and, um, and Long Cooper in, in Newcastle to, I guess down to Newcastle from here, but up from Melbourne anyway, <laughs> to work with a column cell and just the froth. And again, the tails were, were lighter than the floats. Okay, here's the, the grade recovery curve. Um, so with no collector, uh, here's the point. With the packs, okay, we had a, a curve over here. And when we added the temperature responsive polymer, the, the way we usually add it is at room temperature, let it absorb and then increase the temperature. But we also thought that um, that in temperature increase is a difficult and costly right, to implement in industry. And that if the stuff heats up during milling. We just add the polymer after it's already at a high temperature and we'll see if it works. And in fact, when we add it at 50 degrees and then float at 50 degrees, we get even higher grades. Okay. And um, I, I think there were some, well, well, Will had some hypothesis about desliming was, was, was helping with that. So anyway, um, we are able to improve both the grade and the recovery by the flocculation flotation. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention, this is the minus 20 micron fraction where we saw the, the biggest improvement with the polymer. Of course, the, the coarser size, the um, conventional packs was, was working pretty well. So we did a, a techno-economic analysis on this, um, not 10 years later, but maybe a couple of years later anyway. And, um, you know, <clears throat> depending on the commodity and the size of the mine, it's, it's um, easy to justify 10 to $50 million um, additional profit um, for a single mine. The, it depends on the, the feed grade and especially the current recovery. I mean, if the current recovery is already 92 or 
there's not much more to get. If the current recovery is in the, the 70s to, to, to 80, then, then there's a lot more profit to get. The cost of the polymer is, is really important, and the cost of the polymer should be pretty low, around $10 per kilogram. And also, the need to change the temperature is costly and, and difficult. So this is when maybe about five years ago, I said we did a lot of nice work on these temperature responsive polymers, and um, we've learned a lot from it, but let's see if we can do the same thing with commodity reagents, which are affordable to the industry, the industry is familiar with, and actually more importantly than that, they're available. I mean, we, we went to, uh, I talked to BASF about polynipam, and they said, do you know how much monomer there is in the world? I said, I don't know. They said, there's not enough, not even enough to make a tenth of what we would need. And then I was about to say, oh, well, you can produce the monomer, and then, you know, but you're, that's not their business. I mean, and so, um, so yeah, we started trying commodity reagents. So here's the schematic of it. We had a um, polymer flocculant, which selectively adsorbs to the, the valuable mineral. I mean, I guess you could actually reverse float if you wanted in certain cases. Um, that flocculation, um, that, that flocculates selectively the valuable mineral, and I'm drawing the perfect situation here. Of course, there's likely to be in some entrapment, and, and we, we will recognize we have to work on avoiding entrapment. We then add a collector, which selectively absorbs now onto the, the valuable mineral, makes those flocks hydrophobic, and then we can float them and recover them. So yeah, we use the um, anionicity and cationicity of the conventional polyacrylamide flocculants to impart selectivity to charged minerals, and then we add the um, selective collector. The systems we've been looking at is Jacqueline's been looking at hematite separation from quartz, and she's just um, in, finished her second year of her PhD. Regina is looking at um, separating um, chalcopyrite from first quartz, and maybe we'll, we'll work on pyrite eventually. Um, she's just a year into a PhD, and Danny is working on separating spodumene from, from quartz, and then uh, eventually, hopefully, feldspar. She's about six months into her PhD. So the general approach is first to take the individual minerals and um, so selectively flocculate them, find out which polymer will flocculate one but not the other at the same dose and can pH and such like. Then make a mixture, selectively aggregate and separate them. And we try to separate them first by sedimentation and take the sediment and, and um, do the chemical analysis on that versus okay. the supernatant. And then finally, uh, we'll try some aggregate flotation. So Jacqueline's working with ultrafine, about one to two micron hematite and quartz. Um, we use the conventional polyacrylamide flocculants, about four to, to 10 megadaltons. We have a, a range of anionic um, flocculants from, from Cytec. We have a range of cationic flocculants. Um, I think these are from SNF. And we can see, we can, um, anyway, flocculate um, hematite with an anionic polymer. And maybe I should just. Go back to arrow. I'll just turn it off. Yeah, okay. Anyway, so this is what it looks like when it's uh, stirring. Uh, we we started about uh, 1,200 reciprocal seconds, which is uh, um, estimated to be a similar shear in a mechanical cell. And then when we stop the stirring, we have um, sedimentation. So this is with the anionic polymer. Mm -hmm. So we take the individual minerals and with our quartz, we use a cationic polymer and we've investigated the role of polymer charge. The higher charge, the lower dose we need to make a, um, a clear supernatant. So this is the turbidity as a function of dose. When the turbidity is low, 
means the aggregates have settled within the whatever it is, two or three minutes that this was taken. Um, similar trend with the hematite, positively charged hematite, well, or nearly neutral hematite, there's some positive charges on it and the anionic polymer adsorbs. Again, when we increase the charge density to 20 or, or, um, or 50%, we um, can effectively aggregate it at a lower dose. We, um, so here are the zeta potentials, the hematite and the silica. And initially we thought we could do it at, you know, at a low pH, like pH five, when then we could have very clear separation. Uh, and at a pH five, you could get se um, selective absorption of the polymers based on charge. Problem is at pH five, we have heteroaggregation and, and basically everything gets collected because the, 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 Quartz and the hematite are obviously charged and, and always attract each other. We tried dispersants and things like that, but you know, soon just abandoned pH five because then working at, at pH 10 is where we work, where now, although both minerals are actually negative, the, um, there's still some residual positive charge on the, some small amount of positive charge on the uh, hematite, which we, believe is what allows the, the anionic polymer to absorb. And actually the, the, the selection rule, which I think is more important than finding one which absorbs on the valuable mineral is find a polymer which does not absorb to the gang, right? So you want it to not, you want to make sure the gang is not, um, uh, is, is not uh, flocculated. So the negative charge Right on the, um, right on the quartz and the negative charge of the anionic polychromide prevents it from absorbing. Okay, and so here are some adsorption isotherms uh, of the, the hematite in red and the quartz uh, in the, the gray of the anionic polymer onto the mineral surfaces. We can see we have much stronger adsorption onto the hematite and very little absorption onto the quartz as we want. Uh, we see also a trend in the, the, um, the polymer charge. When we take the same dose, uh, the optimal dose, which is around 150 to 300 grams per ton of the polymer, uh, and we take that anionic polymer and dose it into quartz, we find that there's um, very little sedimentation, the, the, um, the supernatant um, turbidity, instead of being you know, like this in the, the below a thousand or a hundred is up in the, the maximum of the, the, the turbidity unit we have is uh, seven and a half thousand. We uh, received a um, in situ particle size imaging and sizing probe from Blaze Metrics. It um, has, a, has a laser which makes a, a nanosecond flash that takes a picture. Then the, the pictures are um, interrogated by image processing to get the cord length distribution. So it goes across the picture and says, this is black, this is black, now it's white, now it's white, now it's black, and gets the cord link distributions. So I'm going to report cord link distributions, although I'll call them a size. Okay, it's not a, it's not a actual size. Uh, you can convert the cord link distribution to a size if you want. Um, but what, and in any case, you can see at the optimum doses for the, for the three different polymers, we get large aggregates. Right. The aggregation is on order of, you know, between 70 to, to uh, around 150 microns. Uh, when we um, put the probe in the, the quartz suspensions, we, we don't see any aggregation, either with or without the polymers. Uh, there's a small aggregation, right, for some of the polymers. So the particle size is coming up to the average cord length, maybe about, you know, um, 20 or 30 microns, but compared to with the hematite, where we can get again between 70 to about 150 microns on average, um, 
cord link distribution. So we can selectively flocculate um, as, as individuals, the, the, the hematite, but not the quartz. We have some information about how the size depends on the dose. The um, solid lines are the 20%, the 60%, and the 6% polymer. The dashed line below, so that's after five minutes of conditioning. After 10 minutes of conditioning, the aggregate size breaks down, as shown by the, the dashed lines below. Okay, but they're still sort of in a range where uh, we feel they could be um, collected by, by um, flotation or attach well to bubbles. Yeah, so we can we can selectively aggregate them individually, but let's look at what happens when we put a 50-50 mixture of uh, quartz and hematite together, it becomes a bit more complicated. If we add the quartz and hematite together at pH 10 uh, without any dispersant and we add the flocculant, Basically, everything uh, aggregates. The, the, the negatively charged quartz and hematite are attracted to each other, and the flocks contain uh, half hematite and half quartz. So we realize we need to add a dispersant. So we've been using sodium hexametaphosphate. And the sodium hexametaphosphate, schematically shown here, will absorb on the, the quartz surface and displace the the negatively charged quartz particles. Um, here are the zeta potentials of the quartz and the hematite as we add sodium hexametaphosphate. The quartz is at about minus 45. It doesn't change the zeta potential much. It stays about minus 50. As we increase the dose of the sodium hexametaphosphate, we increase the uh, negative charge from about minus five millivolts up to where we're working is generally around 300 um, grams per ton. So we end up with a, a, a negative 30 millivolts, but we believe, well, for some reason, the anionic polymer is still absorbing. Either there's residual um, cationic um, sites left on that polymer or there's specific hydrogen bonding to the, to the surface hydroxyls for some reason. When we add the, well, we just wanted to check when we add the dispersant, 300 to 500 grams per ton, we um, still produce flux. So this is with uh, 200 grams per ton of the 20% anionic polymer. Um, without any dispersant, we form a flux. With 500 grams per ton, we form flux with thousand grams per ton dispersant we're perhaps overdosing the dispersant and making some of the the hematite particles too negatively charged so that the, the flocculin isn't working so you can see um some of the individual primary particles here if we overdose the dispersant so we generally work about 300 to 500 grams per ton um, now, when we have the mixed mineral, 50% uh, hematite, 50% quartz with, um, okay, uh, none, uh, 300 or 1,000 grams per ton of uh, dispersant and 200 grams per ton of the 20% anionic polymer, we see we can form blocks. We find some individual particles which haven't become aggregated. Hopefully, most of the particles in the flux are hematite, and most of the particles which are not in the flux are quartz. Um, uh, and here's the flux size. So the flux sizes, again, are still in the order of, you know, between 70 to, to 100 microns. We first tried to separate them by sedimentation. And so now the sedimentation, we um, allow it to settle, is settled for 10 minutes. Um, you can see the most of the hematite is on the bottom. The, 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 the supernatant is more um, white, so it's quartz. If we don't add any dispersant, basically everything settles. The, the grade of the sediment is 50% hematite, 50% silica. The um, recovery of the hematite in the sediment is 
and what's left in the sediment is only 1% of, of um, silica. Um, there's not even enough silica to actually measure the, the grade. We've measured it by X-ray fluorescence. When we increase the dispersant concentration, we increase the, the grade of the sediment up to 55 and 56%. Uh, we re retain a high recovery of, of the hematite. Um, more of the, um, the quartz is staying in the supernatant, so the, the dispersant is doing its job, but upgrade from 50 to 56 percent is not anything to really be excited about. So there's a lot of um, both in, perhaps entrapment and entrainment when the particles come down. And at first I was, oh, we should do this better. We, we should really show we can separate this. And then I finally realized, I told the students, no, this is great because then it justifies why we have to float these flocks to separate, to get a better separation. So um, Jacqueline's done some preliminary flotation tests and really just begun to do some tests in the Denver cell. Um, and you can see this is the, uh, the flotation starting, right? We have you know, whatever, 300 gram per ton dispersant. Uh, poly anionic polyacrylamide, um, sodium oleate as the collector, and some MIBC, and the froth is starting to come over. This is what the tails look like at the end. So you can see there's more white, mainly quartz there. Here's the the um, right the froth collected. Here's the tails. And so the grade recovery is looking pretty good. Um, Okay, so increasing after about eight minutes, we've recovered uh, about 98.5% of the hematite. Um, the grade increases for a while. And then as we start, you know, going later and later, the grade goes down and we're, we're recovering a bit more quartz. The cumulative grade now is about 62% um, Fe203, not 62% iron, um, which is anyway an upgrade from the 50 50. And these are really just early days. The um, flotation um, conditions and, and the reagent um, doses haven't been optimized, but we're we're optimistic that you know you, you at least the PhD will sort of work um, to some extent. Uh, the second student, Regina, is um, working on separating chalcopyrite from quartz. They're about like five to six microns in size. Again, she is using PAX as the collector, um, anionic and cationic flocculants. At pH 9, the chalcopyrite is about negative 20 millivolts, and the, the quartz is about minus 45 millivolts. The cationic flocculant will aggregate both the chalcopyrite and the quartz. There's a bit of, of haziness in the quartz. It's um, not a perfect flocculation, but it does flocculate both. The anionic polymer will um, aggregate only the chalcopyrite, but not the quartz. And that's why I said, again, what we're sort of looking for is the polymer, which does not aggregate the one that you don't want to float. And what we, we just tried it, we tried to, but we still don't really know why does, does anyone know why is anionic polymer Flocculate negatively charged chalcopyrite. What's the bonding? Does anybody tell me how it's, how it's binding? Anyway, so that's something else for, for Regina to do in her thesis. Um, uh, yeah, so that's confirmed by the turbidity. If we add no polymer to the chalcopyrite, it's a very turbid supernatant. As we um, add the polymer, the higher molecular weight polymer produces clear supernatant. Uh, with the quartz, we have high turbidity and no settling um, with, with any of the anionic polymers. Um, the adsorption isotherms confirm that the anionic polymer does absorb more to the chalcopyrite than the quartz. The cationic polymer absorbs to both of them um, almost similarly. So the anionic polymer is giving us good selectivity between the Chalcopyrite in the quartz. 
Again, Regina is a little bit farther behind, but she's done some uh, uh, particle um, uh, aggregate size analysis with the Institute probe. The, the, the particles before aggregation show about a 20 micron um, size. The probe actually uh, uh, doesn't have a re good enough resolution to measure the, the actual, we know by light scattering, the particles are about five or six microns. The probe uh, actually, anything that's less than about 10 microns, it reports about 20 microns. So uh, probe is not perfect, but it's clear that after we add um, the anionic polymer, the chalcopyrite particles are aggregated. You can see by the pictures and the cord link distribution is giving you about 100 microns in size. Then just adsorption isotherm of um, uh, uh, packs onto chalcopyrite, but doesn't adsorb onto quartz. Uh, preliminary um, captive uh, bubble contact angle measurements show that the, the packs increases the contact angle on the chalcopyrite, which is no surprise to anyone. And again, a very preliminary um, flotation um, with the, the anionic uh, polymer flocculating the chalcopyrite. Uh, PAX is a collector MIBC. She only collected the froth for one minute. And um, so the, the overall recovery was low. The, only about 32% of the chalcopyrite. But from that first concentrate, the, the grade was 31% copper, which is about 90% chalcopyrite, okay, 10% quartz. And again, being um, just the end of her first year of PhD, I'm happy with the progress and looking promising, and we can um, try to optimize it. And with that, I'm just gonna finish and say, so we're, I think we're making good progress. We can um, use the temperature responsive polymers to selectively flocculate and, and float minerals. Uh, it's probably a bit expensive. We can selectively flocculate hematite from quartz as individual minerals. We can selectively flocculate chalcopyrite from quartz as individual minerals. We often do need a dispersant and are very carefully control the pH. It's not gonna work at every pH and, and uh, concentration. Um, we impart the selectivity by the charge on the commercial um, polyacrylamide flocculants. We can do some separation by sedimentation, but um, you know, just doing some preliminary results show why there's a lot of entrapment and entrainment. And you know, of course, I'm aware that um, people have been selectively flocculating hematite from quartz for 30 or 40 years and really never implemented it in, 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 in many mines because the right the, the, it's, it's not that effective of a separation. Um, we can add the surfactant to, to make the aggregates hydrophobic and they can be recovered in a mechanical cell. And although still entrapment is an issue in entrainment and I have ideas that, you know, with uh, a multiple, um, you know, a, a rougher and then a cleaner. So, so breaking them up and cleaning them and aggregating them a second time will probably in, in, increase the grade and reduce the entrapment the second time. So with that, I'd just like to thank my um, colleagues and uh, students and the ARC Center of Excellence for enabling eco-efficient beneficiation of minerals. Um, uh, Danny's project is with the Future Battery Industry, CRC and thank Solvay and SNF for the polymers. And with that, I think we have 15 minutes or so for questions. Thank you. Thanks, George. So let me have to see if any questions there. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Charles. That was a Thanks. really great summary. Many years of work. Yeah. Um, I do think the question of polymer absorption onto surfaces that isn't just driven by charge. Yeah. We know that much. Yeah. Enough by now. We don't actually know what on earth does drive it. And with that, we don't actually have a very good handle on this activity with anything towards oxide minerals, where we are primarily looking at charge. We've been charges and everything. Do you think what are the next frontiers on designing actually selectively absorbing 
on the West Bronx sites. We've done that before. Some sites to a great degree. We've got on the Well, there's a, a couple of um, things which are that we we could work with ab initio modeling and try and understand what types of chemical functionality will absorb onto different mineral surfaces. It's not a simple job because you can't just take the crystal, cut it, and put the molecule there. Most people will do that and they'll do it in vacuum. That tells you nothing. You need to let the surface um, relax and hydroxylate. And then you need um, not only water, but usually some explicit water molecules in that kind of model. So it's a lot of work, but that might give us some clues as to what's going on. Uh, the other one, which is probably not easier for me, but easier for some people is um, spectroscopy, trying to understand how, how the, the um, different reagents are bonding onto to the mineral surfaces. All right, and I'll just mention for the people online, you can talk a question into the Q&A or raise your hand, and then we can find you. Yeah. Is that a question? Thanks, George. Um, is there not a concern that the progenitor and the plantation cell will break the column cell? We talked about doing something like the column cell, but it's more yeah. the There is a concern, and um, so one of the things uh, Regina is going to be doing is looking at the aggregate size at different shear rates, at high and low shear, and see what types of aggregates can survive in high shear rates. Actually, the supposed average um, shear rate in a mechanical cell of around 1,000 to 1,200 reciprocal seconds in an industrial cell is what we use when we make the aggregates in a we believe in our lab scale Denver cell, the shear is much higher. But when we haven't stuck the probe in there, we're pretty sure the aggregates are smaller and broken down, and but they're still large enough to be to be floated. And so you're absolutely right. We we want to understand what um, which kind of aggregates can survive in different shear environments. And Will did work both in the mechanical cell and in the column. And we thought the column would produce a um, a better result, but it was actually not that much different. So it will depend on, and as you start um, trying to reduce the amount of polymer, which will reduce the cost, right? To, to get then the plots will become easier to break up and things like that. And then there will be some limit where you'll have aggregates which are not strong enough to survive. All right, we had a question from online from Naomi. So, what is your expectations regarding other gang meetups? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I try the easiest thing first. <laughs> yeah, separating the pirate. Okay, I, I'm I'm not an expert in flotation. First off, I, I learned everything I know from Lisa in the last ten or fifteen years, and. Um, so I don't really know a lot about EHPA. I don't know about you know activation very much about you know other um, ions which dissolve off the surface and reprecipitate out. So there will be at first we want to demonstrate the concept is viable, and then there will be a lot of work to find the right chemistry which will produce a chalcopyrite aggregate, but but not aggregate pyrite. And in our um, work with spudgamine, feldspar, and quartz. It looks like the preliminary work says, you know, we can selectively aggregate spudgamine, but not quartz. The feldspar is somewhere in between, but it's much more like the spudgamine. So the, probably separating the feldspar from, from the spudgamine is, is more challenging. Thank you. And one more from one line from measurements. So, how would you disperse the flux between the rough and the plant stages to minimize it? Trapping in the final concentrate, and would you need pH condition 10 or 2 between the roughers and cleaners? Yeah, between the roughers and cleaners, either just shear the heck out of them to break them up. And then, you know, we probably have to add more flocculant because usually uh, with the temperature responsive, 
polymers, we always thought flocculate them, cool them down, that'll disperse them and then heat them up again a second time. So, I mean, I think in the case um, when we're using conventional reagents, we'll just have to shear them at high shear to break them up and then, then aggregate them again. Any more questions in the room? Uh, this works. Uh, Thank you, Professor, for inspiring this talk. Thank you. Um, the focus a lot on technical responsive polymers, and my question is how about the pH responsive polymers? Ah, uh, we did way back when I did one with um, pH. I mean, it works as well. Yeah, you can change the um, uh, with charge, particularly. Um, we use, for example, chitosan, which is biopolymer. Uh, at low pH, it's positively charged. And then above pH 7 or 8, it becomes neutral and hydrophobic. And you can do it with pH. But I did a very early on some preliminary techno-economic analysis, and I just said no mineral processing uh, industry wants to put a, a truck full of, of acid in and then a truck full of base and shift the pH back and forth. That, that was my... You know, there's probably some operation where they're already changing the pH or something for one reason or another where it might be useful. And same thing, there might be some operations where the temperature change is inherent in the system. Um, but, you know, the, the industry doesn't want to solve exactly this one problem. They want one magic reagent you put in. And it, it does everything for every right. So um, there, there probably are some cases where you can use the pH responsive one, and um, it, it it does work. But so sorry, we only did that for um, sedimentation and separation. We never used the pH responsive one for for flotation. So maybe we could go back to that, yeah, and and use something like a chitosan, um, which will make the, the flux hydrophobic at higher pH after. At first, aggregating them at lower pH. Uh, my judge, it was a very good presentation. Thank you. It is not a question, but I just want to contribute. When I used to work in copper flotation plant, we had a very huge um, frog monsters, including the circuit. And we decided to recirculate concentrated thickener overflow water directly to the cleaner circuit. And in that case, we used to uh, grind under 20 micron, and we have very, very fine material. And we saw that that frog monsters, we could deal, I mean, that frog monsters become much more controllable. And we saw some recovery increase in cleaner circuit as well. But the concept was very unusual at that time, so we couldn't continue for a very long time. And I'm not sure if the ticker overflow contains enough flow. I'm not very sure. But I think that I think this also helps for the frog uh, controlling the frog size that you need to. Uh, I mean, for 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 industries that you can control your frog or overfloating, and also that you can recover very very fine material. But it is very hard. So, so you so using the flocculent. To aggregate the particles so the froth is not too stable. Uh, that, that could be. But, I mean, before froth was over frothing, but yeah. we, after that thing, because I think we got rid of a bit of very fine material, yeah. so we could able to uh, control the froth much better yeah. than before. So I found it very helpful, but it was also because your operation must be very stable to control everything in that stage. So it is hard to measure industrial scale, but I found it very useful yeah. at that time. So I think this concept yeah. could be very yeah. nice. You're right. Some flocculent is probably coming from the thickener overflow back. Um, but um, I would think there's a lot of flocculent would go with the underflow with the yeah. particles. So yeah. it's a pri partitions between yeah. the two. I don't know what was the layer yeah. of that concentration at that point. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Follow up from that. The, the whole concept was for stabilization of particles. Really, we found it where you have to look at the interplay between size, shape, factors, and hydrophobicity. So it is actually entirely possible that by controlling, by creating 
lovely flocks as opposed to small shock particles, you might be doing a lot to control um, the rupture of the interlayer um, uh, of the interfaces yeah. um, in the frog. So I think that is actually a potentially interesting side um, sidetrack. Um, that, that's my challenge for the next five years, understand frothing. <laughs> Just move back to some of the online questions now. So I have a question from Tony. Would we need to pre-classify the ultrafonts from existing flotation cells to apply these new techniques? Uh, yes. Yeah, the techno-economic analysis says that um, the most economically viable is to um, de-slime at the beginning and treat the slimes as a separate stream and let the majority of the um, stream go through the conventional process. The other option is taking the tailings from the conventional process um, and then doing a hydrocyclone cut there and then just process the, um, the slimes of the tailings. Uh, but it ends up being more costly because you end up putting more material of a lower grade through the, the fine flow of through our new process. Yeah. And then one more in line from uh, my husband. So, how would you decide the hydrogen and parameters and speed and airflow rate to avoid entrapment and entrapment? We haven't. The students, my students, don't know anything about flotation before they started putting stuff. So, uh, what we we're gonna uh, ask Lisa. That's what. I'm <laughs> so. Uh, I mean, we, okay. So in general, we think um, that lowering the the airflow rate will will reduce the entrainment, um, let the froth stay uh, longer time stable, let, let let the drainage come out. Reducing the entrapment is perhaps by um, going to a higher speed, which breaks the aggregates up, let lets the 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 um, the gang come out, and then then reform again. So those are the general things that I think might help. Uh, thanks for a very interesting presentation, George. Um, maybe one other thing to consider for entrainment is um, potentially making a frog washing as a way of um, yeah. advising entrainment. There's a lot of new technologies out there that uses a part of it. Yeah. Are there setups for, for um, lab scale mechanical cells? Yeah, that's what you yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, that's what you yeah. oh, Thank you. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, so the other, sorry, uh, one of the things to decrease the entrainment is probably decrease the solids content. Will it decrease the entrapment? The other to um, the online question here. Yeah. Um, the problem with ultrafines with, with the valuables that they don't float, is they're too small, and with the, the gang is with the entrains. Yeah. So I'm just wondering you're, you're flocking the valuables in order to float them. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there no value in flocculating can in order for it not to be oh. Yeah, oh. selectively flocculating both in the same at the same time. That's if we could get uh, two different reagents which would do that but not interact with each other, that would be that would be very yeah, that would be very beneficial. Actually. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, if we're going to, then we can't use charge because if you put a cationic and an anionic polymer, then they'll complex. But yeah, if you use a different mechanism for controlling the absorption, yeah, you're right. If you aggregate the gang as well, then it, it will, it won't be in trans much. Yeah. Um, I suppose the problem with that is that you're going to have complexes in the system. That's going to make it very confusing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One thing at a time, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, George, very much. This is not my feeling, but I understood you could talk to us a great compliment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you brought back a few memories um, because you mentioned as a throwaway line that people have been mucking around with selective population for 30 and 40 years. Yeah. Well, more than 40 years ago, I was a very junior. 
went to an Imperial College and Joe Kitchen was the guru. Oh, yeah. And the, the flirtation group there were very excited about sort of population. They were doing a lot of work in that field, published on it. Uh, and I think that was for, as you talked about in the talk, it was more for separation by sedimentation yeah. than by flirtation. I just wondered if all that body of work has any relevance to what we're doing today. Um, I mean, we we look at it, and it's 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 helpful to understand some. Yeah, it is helpful somewhat. Yeah. But you're right; it, it, industrially, it didn't really go anywhere. Yeah, I just wonder why that was. Do you think? Ah, uh, well, the easy answer is it, it didn't produce any profit. <laughs> So, but yeah, I don't know the technical reason. Probably, you know, uh, entrapment as, as well. And so I was actually in charge of doing some of the literature review on this. Uh, so I have looked at a lot of the a lot of the early ones that was done there. And the the biggest laboratory success that was had with the active population was by using again combinations of reagents where you had to introduce a proper liner reagent to cancel the absorption size from the gang and then introduce a more longer, so that would be a shorter chain of liner, and then a longer chain actual swap line to go and try to swap the chain of targeting. And you ended up with a system so that was pretty complex that it wasn't possible to control. So you had an interplay between two reagents with selective indulgence, one towards the gang, yeah. one towards the, the variables, which is what JP suggested. And all of that coupled with the fact that all of that is a function of shear. So you have to control the shear, which controls the aggregate size and growth, but also has an effect on the absorption rates and the kinetics between the system. And it was just a big mess. Of I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if our work ends up being a big mess, which doesn't doesn't actually get implemented, you know, universally as well. But it's science. We're making science. Um, I think the reason why I think we have a better chance of success with Imperial Institute is because we had the the first one was a forty years ago. The issue of trying to deal with very, very fine material is a hell of a lot more pressing than yeah. it was back then. Yeah. Therefore, there is a lot more appetite to have the succeed and therefore we can count on the rate of the resources and involvement for the industry to solve the problem. Yeah, and, and the um, societal pressure to um, produce less waste and to, to recover more is, you know, it's quite different these days. All right. Well, if there are no further questions, you might uh, wrap up. So, please join me in uh, thanking George once more. Thank thanks for coming today, and I look forward to talking to you all later. And thanks for everyone who came online. Much appreciated. <laughs>